In this section, we will discuss the inverse functions of the circular functions. Hi, my name is Tom Atwater. First, let's review the steps for finding the inverse of a function which was introduced in a previous chapter. Number one, if a function f is one to one, then f has an inverse function, f inverse. Two, in a one to one function, each x value corresponds to only one y value, and each y value corresponds to only one x value. Three, the domain of f is the range of f inverse, and the range of f is the domain of f inverse. Four, the graphs of f and f inverse are reflections of each other about the line y equals x. And five, to find f inverse of x from f of x, follow these steps. First, interchange x and y. Second, solve for y. And third, replace y with f inverse of x. Now let's look at how to find the inverse of, for example, the sine function graphically. So first, let's look at the graph of sine. Right here, we see the sine curve. Notice that I have on here that we need to restrict the domain. The reason for that is, in order for this to be a function, it needs to pass the horizontal, or a one-to-one -one function, it needs to pass the horizontal line test. And you'll see that if I draw a couple of horizontal lines in red, that in order for it not to intersect at more than one spot, we need to restrict the domain between negative pi over 2 and positive pi over 2, which then gives us the blue curve. Now, in terms of finding the inverse graph, remember that we just said that the graph of the inverse is reflected about the line y equals x. So in our next graphic, you will see that what happens is the blue line gets reflected about this line y equals x. So let's take a look at that. Here we have the graph for sine inverse of x, which also can be read as the arc sine of x. It's another way to say sine inverse of x. Notice that what's happened here is that the y values have become the x values, and the x values have become the y values, which is to say that the domain of the original function has become the range of the inverse, and the range of the original has become the domain of the inverse. OK, so now what I'd like to do is look at an example of finding and using that curve that we just looked at. And so let's look at the following example. Find y if y equals arc sine of 1 half. And then a second example, y equals sine inverse of negative 1. Starting with arc sine of 1 half. What we would do is we would look for the x value of 1 half, which would be approximately here, look up to the graph, and then read off the corresponding y value. Well, it's given to us right here that the y value is pi over 6. So what I want to say about this is another way of thinking of arc sine of 1 half is to say, what is the angle whose sine is 1 half? So let me say that again, that when we have the arc sine of 1 half, or the sine inverse of 1 half, another way to say that is we're asking the question, what angle has a sine of 1 half? So for the second problem, we could ask the same question. What angle has a sine of negative 1? Well, the negative 1 refers to the x value, which is right here. When we go down on the graph, we come to this point right here. And that's telling us that the angle whose sine is negative 1 is negative pi over 2. So the solution is negative pi over 2. 
Now, let's look at the inverse cosine. And the process for finding the inverse cosine is, that, is the same as that of for sine. So we'll look at the graph of cosine. Here's the graph of cosine. And in order for this to pass the horizontal line test, which tells us that it's a one-to-one -one function, we must restrict the domain to be between 0 and pi. And then that would give us the blue solid graph as being the graph for cosine x. Now, let's remember that in order to find the inverse function, if we draw the line y equals x, we are going to re reflect this graph about that line y equals x, and that would give us the following graph. So remember that the domain has become the range, and the range has become the domain for the inverse function. So you can see that the domain for cosine inverse, which we can also call arc cosine of x, goes the domain goes from negative 1 to positive 1. And the range goes from 0 all the way up to pi. Again, we have a one-to-one -one function, and that's the need for the restricted values. All right, so now what we'd like to do is use this graph and do an example that we can find the value for an inverse function. So using the graph, we're going to find y if y equals arc cosine of 1, and then we'll do the second problem. So in the first example, y equals arc cosine of 1. That means x is 1. So we go right to this spot right here, and we see that the y value is 0. Once again, one of the ways that we can look at that is we can say, what is the angle whose cosine is 1? And the angle whose cosine is 1 is 0. For the second problem, we want to find the cosine inverse, or the inverse cosine, of negative radical 2 over 2. Negative square root of 2 over 2 is the x value. So the x value for negative square root of 2 over 2 is approximately there. So when I draw a line up, I land at this point, and that tells me that the angle whose cosine is negative square root of 2 over 2 is 3 pi over 4. So that's my solution. Now let's look at the tangent function and finding the inverse from that. So here's my tangent function. And what you'll notice is we need to restrict the domain simply between two of its vertical asymptotes because in this entire restricted domain from negative pi over 2 up to pi over 2, you can see that it passes a horizontal line test no matter where I am on that. And therefore, we know that the domain for this will be restricted between negative pi over 2, comma pi over 2. And once again, we reflect this line about the line y equals x, and we'll see the graph for the inverse function. And there we have it. Once again, you can see that the angle values are going along the y-axis. Pi over 2 is one example. And the real number values are going along the x-axis here. Once again, we can call it tan inverse or inverse tan of x, or we can refer to it as arc tan of x. Once again, you can see in the picture that we've restricted the range of this function between negative pi over 2 all the way up to positive pi over 2. So now, the rest of the inverse trigonometric functions are defined similarly. Their domains and ranges, as well as the quadrants, are shown in the following graphic. Now, for the first three, we've already looked at sine, cosine, and tangent. 
And here's a summary of their domains and ranges. And it tells us we're in quadrants one and four for the sine, one and two for the cosine, and one and four for the tangent. The other three functions, remember, are the reciprocal functions. And that's how I was able to determine the domains and then the ranges as well as the quadrants that those inverse functions would be in. It is generally easier to find the values for the trigonometric functions using a calculator. The inverse functions for sine, cosine, and tangent can be found on most graphing calculators. However, finding the inverse function for cotangent, secant, and cosecant is not so straightforward. These functions must be expressed in terms of other inverse functions. For example, let's find the formula for the inverse of secant x. So we'll start with y equals secant inverse of x. Now, of course, that's the equivalent to secant of y equals x, right? This is saying the angle whose so secant is x, and this is saying the secant of this angle is x. Well, now remember that secant of y is the same as 1 over cosine y using the reciprocal identities. So this is 1 over cosine of y, and that equals x. Then I multiply both sides by cosine y, and I get 1 equals x times cosine of y. And then I divide both sides by x, and I get 1 over x equals the cosine of y. I have one further step to make, which is this is saying the cosine of angle y is 1 over x. And therefore, y equals the cosine inverse of 1 over x. And that's how we can relate finding the secant inverse. The secant inverse is really the same as finding the cosine inverse of the reciprocal. So for all of the functions, you find the reciprocal of the related function. The following graphic summarizes the three relationships. The secant inverse of y is equal to the cosine inverse of 1 over x. The secant inverse of y is equal to the sine inverse of 1 over x. And cotangent inverse of y is equal to the tan inverse of 1 over x. Now let's take a look at an example of finding one of these co-inverse functions. Find y in radians if y is equal to cosecant inverse of negative 3. Make sure your calculator is in radian mode. And then enter the following. We take sine inverse, so second sine. And then we put in negative and then the reciprocal of 3 is 1 divided by 3. Close the parentheses and hit enter. And you'll see the result is negative 0.3398, etc. Therefore, that gives us the value of the inverse cosecant by using inverse sine of the reciprocal. Well, now it's time for you to try two problems. Use a calculator to give each real number value of y. A, y equals arctan of 1.111111. And B, y equals inverse cotan of negative 0.92170128. Pause the video while you work on this problem using your calculator, and when you're finished, restart the video to check your solution. Thank you. 
Welcome back. Let's turn to my calculator and see if you got the same answers that I do. The first example was for y equals arctan, which we can plug in directly by pressing second tan, and then 1.1111111. One, 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 one. Close the parentheses, hit enter, and we come up with 0.83798122. For part B, let me clear this out of the way. For part B, we want to take the cotan inverse of negative 0.92170128. To do that then, we have to do second inverse tan of negative the reciprocal. So let's put in negative 1 divided by 0.92170128. Close the parentheses and hit enter. And we get a result of negative 0.826 one two zero one one nine three but this is outside the range of the inverse cotangent function which has to be in quadrants one and two in other words it has to have values between zero and pi well it's a simple fix to fix the problem we simply add pi to this result so on the calculator all we need to do is push the plus button, and then type in or hit second, and the pi button, hit enter, and we get the answer 2.3154725, which then puts the solution within the proper range for inverse cotan. Well, now let's find function values without using a calculator, but by using definitions of trigonometric functions. Let's try the following problem. Evaluate sine inverse of the tangent of 3 over 2. So to do this problem, we have the tangent of 3 over 2, and we want to find the inverse sine of that. So we're going to look at the following graphic, which shows us a triangle in which we have 3 over as the side opposite theta, right here, and we have 2 as the side adjacent to theta, and then that gives us square root of 13 as the hypotenuse. So if we want to find the sine of this angle, we would take the sine of theta based on the fact that theta is the angle whose tangent is 3 halves. So now the sine would be the side opposite, 3, over the hypotenuse, the square root of 13. But in order to do that, we really should simplify that by rationalizing the denominator. So we would have sine theta is equal to 3 over the square root of 13. Rationalize that denominator, and we get 3 square roots of 13 over 13. And that's the sine of angle theta, which we found by the inverse tan of 3 halves. OK. In this lesson, we learned how to use the calculator for finding inverse of circular functions. Be sure to work the exercises that your teacher assigns, and we'll see you next time.